Good morning and welcome back to our bonus class of History of the Black Experience with Vice President Leonard Moore. I am a, again Helen Warmington from the Office of the Vice President in the Division of Diversity and Community Engagement. Thank you for joining us for our seventh class and uh, we hope that we will see you in future uh, classes that we'll have. Thank you for uh, to all of those who have given us feedback for the course. We haven't gone through them all yet, but looking forward to reading them very soon. Again, as you all know, please be mindful of our house rules that we've listed, listed on the slides. We will have them in the chat room as well. Dr. Moore will be answering questions throughout the class. You may submit questions via the, via the q and A tab on your Zoom menu screen. And we'll be giving questions to Dr. Moore based on the topic he just discussed. Again, the chat room will be open during the programming. Please be mindful and respectful of the space. We will not be taking questions in the chat space. Um, the chat room is a wonderful place to share resources and talk amongst each other. Also, like previous classes, links to the list of materials shared in the chat space will be available on the space, uh, on the syllabus. Um, Stay tuned for more information after the class and Dr. Moore, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Helen and team. Uh, good to see everybody again. Uh, some, uh, if you live in Round Rock like, like we do, um, the Moore Charter School has started today. I got a ninth grader up there um, doing his school stuff and I got 11th grader up there doing, doing her stuff. Um, matter of fact, my son's first class this morning was actually uh, football with the, with the <laughs> meeting with the football coach, which is, which was interesting only in Texas. All right. But anyway, I hope everybody's doing well. Um, uh, we're going to crank back up, uh, UT next week. Um, it'll be a very, very interesting semester for faculty, staff, students, and everybody else, but you know, we'll get through it. You know, I look at it as a learning experience. Um, and I've tried to in many ways, look at the, the whole pandemic as, you know, how can I, you know, learn some new skills, embrace some new technologies. And I think, you know, teaching this class has been very, very helpful to me. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to do this in person. Um, but, you know, so sometimes, you know, when, when uh, things go off script a little bit, there are some silver linings. So silver linings there, again, we would have never been able to do this uh, in person. All right. So today we want to talk about um, a couple of things, black control of central cities. Um, Donald Trump often criticizes black politicians and black mayors. He talks about the mayor of Chicago a lot and the mayor of Atlanta a lot. So we'll talk a little bit about, you know, when black people become, uh, become to, uh, control over uh, inner cities and uh, major cities. And then we'll talk about three of the hot button issues in the 1970s for black folk. Uh, one is going to be school busing. Another is issue is going to be affirmative action. And the third issue, which actually is probably the first, this debate over whether or not black folks should stay within the Democratic Party. All right, so let's, um, so I wanna take you back to about 1970, about 1968 or so, and we'll try to finish up in the 1970s. And I think that'll give you a good grasp of the black experience. And I tell people all the time, I tell my students all the time that the present, what we see, the present is a product of the past, all right? So history is nothing but cause and effect. So what we see in 2020 is an accumulation of what has gone on years and decades before. So around 1968, black people begin to talk about making this transition. This is important now from protest to politics, all right? They realize you, you can only march for so long, you can only protest for so long. And they really start to think about, okay, running for public office, um, you know, getting control of the political levers of a city or a county or a state or even a nation. And so that was big. They un also understood that you know, holding public office would also accrue some material benefits to the community. So they realized that you can only march for so long. They said the marching and all that stuff was just designed to get white people's attention. It was designed to, in many ways, uh, get some kind of white guilt. So they began to strategize in the mid to late 60s about how do we begin to hold public office and how do we begin to put ourselves in a, in a position where we can bring about significant and structural change and institutional change uh, for African-Americans. Now, what you also find in 1964, 1968 is Nixon's Southern strategy. And Richard Nixon, um, he'll run for re-election in 1968. And if you look at, in many ways, the campaign strategy of Richard Nixon in 1968, 
It is the exact playbook President Trump is going to use over the next three months. Basically, Trump is going to try to get all the white Southern votes, and then he it, all the white he want to get to all white Southern votes, and he's also planning to get the rural vote. And Trump believes, in many ways, that can carry him uh, to the White House for another four years. But if you look at Nixon's election in 1968, you will see some of the most vile rhetoric that you that one had ever seen in a presidential campaign. I would say since the Reconstruction period or maybe since the Jim Crow period. Nixon wasn't pulling punches. And what's interesting about Nixon, and this goes back to my point in many ways earlier, is that Nixon is not a Southerner. Nixon is from Orange County, California. So when you talk about the origins of modern conservatism, and we'll talk about that in a minute, this doesn't come from Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas. This comes from Orange County, California, all right? <clears throat> And so the mid 60s, mid to late 60s, we talk about the origins of modern conservatism. This is the first time in American history where you hear white people start talking about big government and not wanting to pay taxes. Now this is interesting because we talked about how um, uh, the, uh, uh, the government and, and federal policy in many ways you know, created the white middle class, you know, giving them houses, giving them land early in the part of 20th century. So, but this is the first time you hear them talking about big government, not wanting to pay taxes, government is overreaching. And the only reason they are suggesting that is because they had no problem paying taxes or they had no problem with government as long as it was exclusively for their benefit. You won't hear anything in the 1940s from white Southerners about not paying taxes. You only hear them complain about paying taxes and about big government when they begin to see some of their tax money being used for everybody, all right? And, and, and that is a critical point. I was thinking the other day, <clears throat> if I was white and I was born in 1930s and 1940s, the government has basically put me in the middle class. Why would I have a problem with big government? Why would I have a problem with government helping out people? It is only a problem. My research said it only became a problem when the governmental policies, government programs, and things of that nature were not exclusively used for white people. That is an important point to make. So what you have going on with this origins of modern day conservatism, white people are leaving the city. We talked about that before. We called that white flight. Um, they don't want to pay taxes. And we talked about white flight, uh, residential flight, and white commercial flight. Now, as these, as these large urban centers become increasingly black, this is an important point, the power structure in these cities, they realize just strictly based on the demographics that we are going to lose the political control of the city. One factor that went on as white people began to leave the city, more black people come into the city, the cities are becoming increasingly majority black. And so the white power structure understood if we keep moving to the suburbs, then who's going to control Cleveland? Who's going to control Detroit? Who's going to control Chicago? Who's going to control Philadelphia and Newark, New Jersey? They understood that based on the, the, the demographics that black people would be in control of the major urban areas. However, as they were going to the suburbs with white flight, you got to understand they still want to maintain what goes on in the city. I don't care how much you talk about inner city Chicago, inner city Detroit, inner city Cleveland, the, 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 the most important institutions in those three cities are going to be located within the city limits. And they knew it. They were going to new suburbs for bigger homes, lower taxes, things of that nature. But they also understood Hmm. We're going to suburban Chicago, but the most important institutions in this city are within this are within the city limits. So here's what, in many ways, <clears throat> uh, whites did as they were leaving the city. So they want to come up with a way. They want to come up with a way where they can live in the suburbs, but still control what goes on in the city. And they did it three ways. Number one, this is important. Something called privatization. I want y'all to get that. I was. I was gonna tell you all to write it down, but I forget I'm not talking to my students. Privatization. Here is how privatization works. So let's say uh, I am the mayor of Detroit. I am white, I'm the mayor of Detroit, and all the contracts uh, and, and everything we do at the Detroit airport, the city runs. So the city, uh, we have a food service contract, 
We have employers there who uh, employees there who clean the airport up. The baggage handlers are all city employees. So pretty much everybody who works at the city of Detroit airport, except the airport personnel, are going to be the city of Detroit employees. So check this out. So if I understand, I'm the white mayor of Detroit, and I understand, man, in about six to eight years, we're not going to have a white mayor anymore. It's going to be a black mayor. So here's how privatization works. They would take all those people off the city of Detroit payroll, the food service workers, the janitors at the airport. And again, I'm just using this hypothetically. And what they would do, they would privatize it. They would take the sanitation deal. They would take the, uh, the, the city trash pickup. Instead of that being a function of the city of Detroit, they would privatize it and give it to a private company. Now, here's why they did it. <laughs> because they understood when these cities became increasingly black, black people would have those jobs. So by privatizing the water company, the utilities, um, sanitation pickup, uh, by, uh, um, um, the landscaping in the city, by privatizing all of that stuff, they could ensure in many ways that what they did, they gave their friends contracts. So if I know that four to six years, this city is going to be majority black, I'm going to give my friend the, 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 the tenure contract to, to, to handle the city sewage system. I'm going to give my friend the tenure contract to handle food services at the Detroit airport. So understand privatization was serious, but it was planned. And so what happens when black people become mayor, when they become to dominate city council, they are saddled with these bad contracts. They are saddled with privatization. And one of the things people have done, they have made an argument that somehow privatizing something is better in many ways um, than for them to do it in-house. And I, I disagree with that. One of the biggest things you see on a college campus, um, many universities, used to handle their own food service contracts. So the people that work in cafeterias, uh, they may serve food in the dining halls, things of that nature. 20, 25 years ago, those people were university employees with certain protections, retirement benefits, pension, all of that. But, but in the name of cutting costs and this idea now that it is cheaper to privatize it, you have most of the universities now have, have private contracts. Sodexo is a big contract. And I'm not saying Sodexo is bad, but this whole idea of privatizing something, particularly at the municipal level or at the local level or the county level, it wasn't designed for efficiency. It had nothing to do with saving money or maximizing profit. It had everything to do with maintaining control over that particular aspect of the city. So now if you are elected mayor of Detroit or Cleveland and you come in and you have an agenda, but you're saddled with all, but everything has been privatized, the power that you once had is now very, very, or the, the power you thought you had is now very, very constrained because as whites were leaving the city, they're getting off the city council, they are no longer running the city, you, they would leave you with these, these bad contracts and it was all in the name of privatization, all right? <clears throat> Let's move on. Number two, the second thing they did, now this is interesting. Second thing they did, uh, they came up with what we call a metropolitan form of government. All right. Heidi, can you put that picture up of um, the Miami-Dade County logo, please? All right. <clears throat> now, when we talk about this stuff, people think it's crazy. So what happened in several cities across America is that they came up with a system called this metropolitan form of government, all right? Here is how this works. And I'll just use Austin as, since we, we, many of us, we live in Austin, I'll use Austin as, 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 hypo, as a hypothetical example. So let's say I'm in Austin, but let's say I live in Westwood or let's say I live in Lake Travis, all right? I move out there. But I really wanna control what goes on in the city of Austin. I really wanna control it. So what they would do, they would strip the city of any power. And then instead of it being a city government, they would call it a county slash city government. So Miami is the city, Dade is the county. Dade, Miami sits within Dade County. But guess what else? There are about 14 other cities that sit within Dade County as well. Coral Gables, uh, Miami Lakes, other cities. So what this does, it allows people who have moved to the suburbs 
to elect their own mayor in their suburb, but now to also elect a county administrator, all right? Let me get this again. This is also used to dilute um, um, black political power. Black people are gonna be the majority in the city, white people move to the suburbs, but then they come up with a county form of government. So again, whites who live in the suburbs can pick their own suburban mayor and elected officials, but then they also create this new structure where now we have a county administrator and the argument they made was again, it was this argument of efficiency. Well, if all the regions in the county are, all the cities in the county are aligned, we are all connected. So we really need somebody who looks out for the issues in the entire, for the entire county and not just the city. That is ridiculous. It was all designed to dilute black political power. So number one was privatization. Number two was this metropolitan form of government. In the city of Cleveland, where I am from, they attempted to create a metro form of government in the early 1950s. We had, Cleveland had seven black folk on city council in the 1950s, and people saw where the demographics were going in Cleveland. They attempted in the name of efficiency to create a, a county form of government. It's not, has nothing to do with being efficient. It has everything to do with trying to dilute minority voting strength, all right? So we've got privatization, we got the metropolitan form of government, and number three, and we had this in good old liberal Austin, Texas, and this is what we call at-large voting, all right? Heidi, can you throw that um, slide up for us? All right, and I really want to explain this because oftentimes people think we make this stuff up. We aren't making it up. It just shows that whenever black folks throughout the history have an opportunity to advance, there are often obstacles placed in front of them. Now, typically the obstacles will make no mention of race whatsoever. However, with privatization and also uh, this metropolitan form of government, it is meant to dilute black voting strength and the number and the third one which was done here in austin texas and i would argue it was done to take voting strength away from uh latinos and black folks primarily latinos in austin was they created something called an at-large voting system let me tell you how this works all right and you see the the slide there it says 10-1 all right so prior to about six seven eight years ago austin city council was a very interesting body. I believe there were eight seats on city council, I think maybe nine seats on city council. And the way it worked, the city wasn't divided up into nine districts or nine wards. It wasn't designed that way. Most cities, you know, if there are nine wards, each ward will elect their particular representative. So I may be a ward nine councilman. My wife may be a ward seven councilwoman. That's how it works in most cities. And that ensured that every area of the city had a representative. But here's what was done in Austin, Texas and other places. They came up with something called at large voting. So if there are nine city council slots, which ought to get this, and I live in Ward 7, I don't go vote for a Ward 7 representative. No, the way it worked is that the top nine vote getters, no matter where they lived in Austin, Texas, got elected to city council. And they called that an at-large voting system. So you may have 25 people running for city council and the top nine voters, no matter where they live, no matter what their uh, race, race or ethnicity was, they got into city council. And because of that, 60 to 70% of all Austin city council members, I would argue between maybe 1950 and 1990, came from two zip codes in West Austin. So West Austin dominated Austin politics. And when they were questioned about this, this, this system that made no sense, they said, oh, well, well, this is, this is for efficiency. We don't like the ward model because if somebody is over ward seven or district eight, they won't look out for the entire needs of the city. They'll just look out for their particular area. So we think this area is much more advantageous for good government. And that is why until gentrification hit, you largely had no new economic development initiatives taking place east of the interstate. I remember when I first came to Austin, I never understood it. I asked somebody, I said, is there a rule that you can't build 
east of I-35. But I mean, even now, if you're coming in from South Austin, it still looks bizarre. It's like, well, why didn't they build on the other side of the interstate? Because there was no interest. They didn't want to build on that side uh, of town. So again, the metropolitan form of government. So about six, seven, eight years ago, maybe not that long ago, there was a referendum to change it. And so what you have now in Austin, Texas, is, is, is a more traditional voting system. I think the city's divided up into 10 districts or 10 wards, and you elect one representative from your ward to represent your interest. Now, here is how uh, crazy this thing was. There were nine city council, I think there were nine city council slots in Austin. Could be wrong, I think nine. There was a gentleman's agreement. I don't know how this worked. There was a gentleman's agreement that of the nine, there would be one slot reserved for a Latino and one slot reserved for an African-American. So the black and Latino community tolerated this token representation. And what people were saying, if you looked at the demographics in Austin, the Latino community should have at least three, maybe four, if not five representatives. But again, this was all used to dilute and minimize African-American Voting strength. All right, we'll take some questions. <clears throat> hey, Dr. Moore, that was a lot in 15 minutes, 20 minutes. So, um, <laughs> uh, so a couple, a few questions in regards to pri privatization. Uh -huh. Is privatization the same as what are referred to as public private partnerships? Are there city public officials that have been able to work to improve contracts and overcome the original intent of okay. privatization? Okay. Um, let me say this, uh, on its face, well, well, the, well, the intent of privatization initially was again to, was to, was to take away power from the people in office. Um, but on its face, privatization, let's, let's say you make the argument that it is a little bit more efficient. When you look at the treatment of the workers, that's where the difference comes into play. Let's use the UT example or any university. Let's say I, I work for housing at the University of Michigan but I am a University of Michigan employee. I got a retirement plan, I got a pension plan, and you just can't fire me, there's a process you gotta go through. When the University of Michigan says, you know what, we're gonna bring in this private company to manage all of that, the wages are typically reduced and the job protections are not there. So we can't look at everything just in terms of what's gonna help us maximize profit or what's gonna help us, you know, um, in many ways, minimize costs. But that's what we have seen is that when these private companies come in and take over, the workers don't have the protections they once had when the entity was being controlled by a, a public uh, public entity mm -hmm. or public agency rather. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Moore, what is your opinion on privatization of public schools? I did teach for America in a charter school in Chicago and had colleges and public schools, but I'm still and I'm still weighing the pros and cons. Oh, sorry. And, and I had colleagues in public schools and I'm still weighing the pros and cons. Now, let me say this as, as somebody who has school choice and I was confronted with that by an activist in Connecticut. He said, Dr. Moore, uh, you and all your bourgeois black friends got school choice. Why can't these poor parents have school choice? It was a very, I mean, he challenged me and I appreciate it. And I said, he is right. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, you, I, and I said, he's right. I do have school choice. And what he said, he said, Dr. Moore, if you don't like the public school your kids are in, you have the money and maybe the social capital, A, to get them moved to another district, a school in the district that you like better, or worst case scenario, you can pay for them to go to a private school. And that, and that was, that. and so, so let me say that. I, I acknowledge that. However, I believe that charter schools are a Trojan horse to destroy public education for kids of color. I really believe that. And, and let, me let me tell you why. Nobody has ever shown how private charter schools are better than public schools. Nobody talks about how charter schools don't have to take special needs kids. They can kick people out. They are held to a different standard than public schools. So I really believe charter schools are a Trojan horse. And if you think about this, economists will tell you that in terms of a large pot, the, the, the last two pockets of public money that is available, public money, two, we, they call it ed med, public education and also um, healthcare, the large two pockets of money. So what people are arguing was that corporate America came up with the charter school hustle 
to get some of their hands on public school money. Go look at Austin ISD's budget. Go look at the budget for the LA Unified School District or the Chicago Public Schools, and you'll see you were talking about large sums of money. But what is happening, and I believe what will happen in Austin, and it's happening now, is that all the schools east of the interstate will largely be charter schools, and everything, and, and, Austin, and Austin ISD will be all white and all Asian. That is my prediction, just looking at uh, the demographics. Um, there are some fine, there are some wonderful people who work in charter schools, but I think we have to look at the long-term effect. What we saw in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, there's no such thing anymore as the Orleans Parish school system. The whole city is primarily full of charter, full of charter schools, and they have very little accountability. Um, in many ways, nobody's really watching what they do. And if you see that, you know, in some of these charter schools are nothing more than money hustles. Uh, Dr. Moore, speaking yep. of privatization, <laughs> this is something that's been, it's current, but uh -huh. about privatization, can you speak on the potential privatization dismantling of the U.S. Post Office and whether you think this fits into any of the issues we have already discussed in class? <laughs> I've but, seen it talk about as a form of voter suppression, but I would wonder if you have other thoughts. Postal service is not going anywhere. Too many people are too many people are dependent upon it. You know what I mean? And you know, I, I don't know why you would privatize anything. I mean, FedEx and UPS have the market on everything else. Uh, but you know, but that's what people talk about. You know, you got this large public entity, you know, well, and, and part of Trump's motive may be to manipulate, you know, the mail-in ballots, but it also may be, hey, as I am exiting office, you know, let me take care of some of my supporters and friends by giving them these contracts. But that is, but that has been going on for thirty or forty years, just not at that level. More at the uh, the, at the uh, state level and a uh, county level and local level. Uh, doesn't it make sense for Metro Austin to have a regional transportation system? I wish they could have seen your picture on your wall, Doctor Moore. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you have to. It does. But 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 let me say this, and I didn't know this before I moved to Round Rock. When we first moved here in 2007, you know, I, I think I, I like taking the bus to work and I can do it now, I couldn't then. But I was told that Round Rock, the, that, that the, the Cap Metro didn't come to Round Rock because the city of Round Rock wouldn't let them come. Now you gotta understand when you talk about a regional public transportation system, what, you're, what, you, what the fear is now is that low income people have access to live in other areas of the city. And, and, and if you ever talked about, talked to um, Dr. Rich Reddick, he talks about the black tax. And I want to talk about the black tax when it comes to housing. Check this out. If we have a regional transportation system, let's say I'm low income, it may be cheaper for me to, to get an apartment in Cedar Park, Leander, than it is for me to get an apartment um, in, in, in the city, East Austin, Northeast Austin. So if I can move to Cedar Park, Leander, get an apartment, $800 a month, my kids are all, all automatically in a well-funded school system. So one of the reasons we don't have a regional public transportation system um, is because I believe people, people want to keep their neighborhoods exclusive, but we got public transportation in Round Rock now. The train, I believe, goes to Leander. But I'll give you one example. Maine or Dell Valley, I, I, don't, I don't know, if, I think there's one bus from Dell Valley per day. And I think Maine, or there may be two buses from Maine, uh, which is more working class now coming to Austin. So, but to answer your question, yes, we do need a regional form of government. What it will take, it will take gas prices to double. Once gas prices double, people leave all that political stuff alone. And they like, okay, how can I take the bus or train uh, to work? We'll take one more, Helen. Okay, um, let's see. Or two more. Two okay, more. Also, so there are several, but I, I'm trying okay. to pick the ones that are, um, that have been voted up, I should say. Uh, what is your opinion on the effectiveness of the 10-1 system, especially as certain districts are rapidly gentrifying? Is this going to negate the original purpose of 10-1 and representation? Well, I was in a meeting a couple weeks ago. We were talking about, somebody said, well, Leonard, you know, what's, you know, what's your community engagement uh, vision for DDCE? And I said, well, I have to get over the fact that, you know, when I first moved here, people kept telling me, 
you know, Austin, we will not allow Austin to turn into San Francisco. San Francisco once had a very vibrant black community. There are no black people in San Francisco now. I was out there for the Texas Cal game several years ago, flew in on Thursday night, didn't hardly see any, any black people on Friday, went to the uh, baseball, the Giants game Friday night, didn't see any black people there. So in San Francisco, black people have been completely removed. Some people could call it ethnic cleanse. They've been ethnic, uh, a form of ethnic cleansing, all right? City of Austin, the black population is continuing to decline. It has continued to decline. Black churches are moving further and further out, more to Northeast Austin. And what we have done, we have talked about this city's prosperity so much. We've let companies come in. We don't force them to hire working class people or low income people. And so as a result, um, you know, we are a massively gentrified city. And so to be honest, I don't even really pay attention to what goes on politically in Austin anymore. I think in terms of middle-class black people, I think they are finding it better in Pflugerville, Round Rock, Cedar Park, Leander. You even got a lot of black folk moving to Buda, all right? And Kyle and places like that. So, um, you know, Austin politics are interesting. Austin needs to come to grips that it's not liberal on racial issues. You may be liberal on a whole bunch of other stuff, but not liberal on uh, racial issues. We'll take one more, Helen. Let's see, can you talk about that? I'm not sure if you know this, but can you talk about the HUD policy in the early 1990s how, and how that has led to racial inequality? I've heard that the HUD policy was the main reason for the inequality we are seeing today between whites and non-whites. I'm not familiar with that policy. I'm sorry, yeah, but yeah, I'm gonna look it up when class is over. All right. Okay. <laughs> Let's go. With all right, I don't. I, don't, I can't. Okay. Sure. Is there any movement within UT Austin to end privatization in food service, custodial sub services, et cetera? I'm not sure, and I'm not sure to what extent. You know, I believe UT has a Sodexo contract. I could be wrong. I'm not sure about uh, the custodial contract. I thought those were UT. Thought those were UT employees. I couldn't be wrong. But, you know, I mean, it has basically been a trend over the last 20, 30 years as universities uh, started seeing their, some of their support from state government dry up. They had to find ways, I mean, they had to find ways to minimize cost, uh, particularly when they, if they want to, when they want to keep tuition affordable. So it's not, it's not, an, it's, it's not that easy of a problem to solve. All right. But my intent was just that when this first happened 30, 35 years ago, it was largely, <clears throat> uh, you know, it was largely designed at the, at the university level, you know, to minimize costs to keep tuition down. All right. Can we move on, Helen? Yes, please you do sure? so. Yes. Okay. All right. So, so, so let me, let me tell you this great Barack Obama story, which leads into this idea of the, the black mayor. All right. So when Barack Obama, I believe he was a state senator in Illinois, community organizer, then he went to the state capitol. I believe state senator, not state rep. So we'll go with state rep, state senator. And what I read, and I need to go confirm this because I've been telling this story for the last 10 years. And if it's wrong, I feel bad. But I remember reading somewhere by some political columnist that, you know, as, as Barack Obama's uh, platform, as, as, his, as his brand was starting in many ways to grow, he hired a firm to explore what would happen if he ran for mayor of Chicago, all right? The firm did the research and they found that if Barack Obama would have ran for mayor of Chicago, he would have crushed Richard Daley. Richard Daley is the son of the famous um, uh, mayor, Mayor Daley in Chicago. Um, and the Daley's have basically run Chicago politics. All right, they have an African-American woman mayor now, but throughout much of the latter half of the 20th century and then the first half of uh, this century, the Daley family basically controlled uh, politics in Chicago. So apparently the story goes that when the Daly family or when Daly's people found out that Barack Obama was potentially thinking about running for mayor, what they do, now I could be wrong, is that they basically set it up to get him, they, 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 want, they want him to take his eyes off the mayor, of being mayor of Chicago. And what they do, they basically encourage him and basically let him know well, if you run for senator, if you run to be one of the senators from Illinois, you'll have our complete support and we will guarantee that you will not have a viable contender. <clears throat> he runs for U.S. Senate and he wins. Now, the reason I tell this story 
And I tell my students is that why would the dailies be more concerned about maintaining controlling city hall when they could when they could potentially a uh, daily could potentially have a Senate seat? Because in terms of abstract power, there is no better position in U.S. political life than being mayor of a big city. You control a humongous budget. You have to, the banks, all the banks have to deal with you. You control a lot of jobs and it is very, very powerful. So in the 60s, black people said, yeah, okay, we're gonna have some folk run for Congress and we're gonna, and we're gonna support that and that'll be good, folks running for Senate. But they really talked about being mayor of a city. And the one quote I remember, they said that being mayor of a city gave somebody the best opportunity to dramatically improve people's lives. Like you could be elected mayor on Friday, you could take office on Wednesday, and by Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, people could start to in many ways see a, a quick improvement in their quality of life. So 1967, you have the first African-American mayor elected uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Heidi, if you can put up that picture of Carl Stokes, please. 1967, he's elected mayor of Cleveland, Ohio. And, and this in many ways was international news and in many ways was the start of things to come. Stokes is so popular that in 1968, he is arguably the most popular politician in the U.S. and people wanted him to run for president in 1968, but he said no, he enjoyed in many ways being mayor of a city. Now, I always ask my students, what is the difference between a mayor who happens to be black and a black mayor? All right, let me ask it again. A mayor who happens to be black and a black mayor. A mayor who happens to be black is one who governs in a race neutral uh, in race neutral fashion, all right? Race neutral policies. Well, my policies uh, help everybody. I can't just look out for black folk. A black mayor is someone who runs for office and that woman or man is coming into office specifically to do one thing, to address black grievances. That's, that's, that's what they, and so the first generation of African-American mayors elected I would say between 1967, 1975, Carl Stokes, Cleveland, Ohio, <clears throat> um, uh, Maynard Jackson, Atlanta, Georgia, Coleman Young, Detroit, Michigan, all of them, Richard Hatcher, Gary, Indiana, they are coming into office with one specific goal in mind. How do I use the power of this office, all right, to improve the quality of life for people who, who, who this city has neglected, all right? And when they get elected mayor, they have basically four or five <clears throat> major things they want to do. Number one, and this, this is important. Number one, the first thing they want to do is reform the police department. That's number one on their agenda. You got to deal with the police department. All right. Number two, second thing they do is they want to improve the quality of public education. Now, of course, you had school boards and school districts that were separate, but black mayors wanted to use the power of their office to improve public education. Number three, they want to improve the quality of housing. So what they would do, I don't know if y'all heard of Section 8 before. Some of y'all know what Section 8 is? It is subsidized housing for low-income families. But what they would do, they would say, you know what? We aren't just gonna put Section 8 or low-income housing in, 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 in inner city areas. We're going to take Section 8 housing all throughout the city. And of course, that created a lot of problems. Number four, they also want to help black business owners. All right. So black mayors, when they come into office, they have a very ambitious agenda. They have a very ambitious agenda. Now, when we talk about helping black business owners. I want you all to think, have any of you all ever flown through the Atlanta airport? All right. Put in the chat if you've flown through the Atlanta airport. Because I want to use this, I want because this is a great example of how black mayors use the power of their office to improve the quality of life for people and also to help out black business owners. All right. So and many have many have, Dr. Moore. Okay, all right. Many so, have. So, all right. So you you will never look at the airport. You will never look at Atlanta Airport again. So here we go. So when you're flying from Austin to Atlanta on Delta, keep this in mind. That Atlanta Airport was rebuilt. Uh mid to late 70s. Maynard Jackson is the mayor of Atlanta. 
the data shows that that airport was responsible for creating 30 to 40 African-American millionaires. All right, let me explain. All right, so let me, let me explain. All right. When Maynard Jackson becomes mayor of Atlanta, he passes a law, an affirmative action law that says, if you have a contract with the city, 40% of your workforce must be African-American. All right. Now, it's amazing to me how these people talk about big government and government needs to go away. But a lot of these same folks got government contracts that they've been eating off of for decades. All right. So so that's one. So 40 percent of your workforce must be African-American. So if you wanted the city contract to build the, the stadium where the Braves play or put semen in or something like that, your workforce had to be 40, 40 percent African-American. So in turn, right, black people are now getting jobs. All right. But Maynard Jackson took it a step further. When they launched, they were gonna, when they announced they were gonna build this airport and people were complaining, well, we don't like this idea. We gotta hire 30 to 40% of our staff gotta be black. He said, grass will grow on the runways if y'all don't do what I say, all right? And now understand it, the power structure, they knew that Atlanta was gonna be a hub. They knew Atlanta was, it was geographically located, all right, to have one of the busiest airports in the country, if not the world. So Maynard takes it a step further. <clears throat> when it came to building the new airport, he made it a point, all right, to basically empower African-American entrepreneurs. I'm going to give a couple base examples. <clears throat> so let's say I, I'm, I live in on the uh, northwest side of Atlanta. I got a plumbing business. I'm not making a lot of money. You know, I'm working class. You know, I, I, I do work at the church. I may go around to people's houses, but I'm good at what I do. I just don't have access to a lot of work. I may be making $20,000 a year. Here's what Maynard Jackson would do. Maynard Jackson would go to that plumber and he would say, I heard a lot of good things about you. Go get your business license and I'm going to give you the exclusive contract to install all the toilets in the airport may go to somebody who had like a paper company who napkins and all they would tell he would tell that person i'm going to give you the, you the exclusive contract to put all the napkins in the airport the big contract came over cement all right a con cement slash concrete can you imagine what the contract was like to to, to pave and put cement on two or three runways and so what made jackson he understands that if I got a woman over here and she and she's a phenomenal cook, all right? She she caters a lot of stuff, doing stuff out of her house, and she'll do stuff at the church and in the community. He would say, sister, I need you to go get a business license because what we're going to do, we want you to have the only soul food restaurant on Terminal 2. And you've been to an airport before. And when you get to go to airports and you get hungry and your options are limited, right? You, you don't have any options. So imagine... If you had the, the one contract that said, okay, we're gonna, you're going to be the airport's only soul food restaurant, and we're going to put you right here in the middle of all the action. What does that do? Maynard Jackson understood that if these small minority business owners could get a big city contract like the Atlanta airport, now I got the Atlanta airport contract. I put in all the toilets. I provided all the napkins. Um, I, 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 I've done all the concrete. Now I am eligible to hire a whole bunch of people and I can go get other work. So if they're building a new uh, uh, courthouse downtown, I can get that job. If they're building a new football stadium, I can get that job. And so that's what people talk about, how the Atlanta airport in many ways created 40 African-American millionaires. And it was all because Maynard Jackson, you know, like many other black mayors, had this vision that his responsibility in many ways was to help <clears throat> black business owners, all right? Any questions at all? We have a few, Dr. Moore. Okay. So mm -hmm. um, let's see, you've talked, so um, I've seen discussion of violence and corruption in Chicago treated mm -hmm. as a dog whistle. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Why is the violence seen as the dog whistle, or why is there violence and corruption in Chicago? <laughs> let me uh, let, let me deal with it. the one thing. I always I've always wanted to know uh, 
when people talk about inner city violence, particularly gun violence, the one thing I've always asked is where do the guns come from? Um, there have been several situations we've seen where police have had these gun buyback programs or uh, they'll give you a hundred bucks if you turn in a gun. Uh, you know, these places where if you have an illegal gun, if you turn it in, uh, you know, you'll be, you know, they'll give you amnesty or something like that. But what has been interesting about these gun buyback programs, things of that nature, is that often those same guns end up back on the street. All right. And I, I bet you if I went to Houston, Dallas, I, I bet you I could go to any major city and go into a large uh, African American or large Latinx community, and it would probably only take me five or 10 minutes to get a gun. That's it. And so I'm just asking people, where do they, these guns come from? Because I don't see a lot of people, uh, black folk going into Dick's and Academy Sports buying guns at the counter. So nobody ever wants to talk about uh, the illegal gun trade. And, 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 and But part of that also is that we have to come to grips that every profession has bad apples, principals, stockbrokers, every, every profession. Um, and there are bad cops out there. We just we just we just got to admit that there are bad cops out there. All right, and and so that's the whole the, the dog whistle piece. But there is a reason why there is so much killing and violence. I mean, look at the unemployment rate. I mean, and so in many ways, you know, we we've taken hope away from people. And so as a result, if people don't have nothing to do and don't have any money, they will do what they got to do to survive. Doctor Moore, you said something or about mayors who happen to be black uh -huh. because they're black. So would you consider Obama to be a president who happened to be black or a black president? Ooh, I knew that question was coming. Um, <laughs> that, 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 is, that is, I don't know. There's a great book I want y'all to check out and I'm not trying to evade the answer. It's called The Price of the Ticket. And this author talks about that Obama in many ways basically ran a race neutral administration, all right? Uh, on several occasions, he'd be like, well, I just can't do stuff for black folks. Uh, and the one thing that the black community really um, thought was interesting is that, you know, he was the president who basically, you know, passed a, a gay marriage amendment. And while black folk didn't have an issue with that, they wanted to know if you can have specific legislation for the LGBTQ community, how come you can't have specific legislation for the African-American community, all right? And so I don't know, but here's the thing I tell you about Obama. If when you are the first black president of the US, who do you pick up and call if you need some advice? He has nobody to call because nobody had ever been in his shoes before. But I think that is a, that's a great question. Typically, historically what we found is that the first generation of politicians uh, got elected, you know, late 60s to mid 70s, very, very racially conscious. Uh, subsequent generations have not been as racially conscious, have always tried to be in many ways uh, more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, more race neutral in their policies, and even in many ways uh, in their language, okay? A few questions about, you, you talked about the Atlanta airport for a little yep. bit, so I think uh -huh. there's a few questions there. Well, why was the, do you know why the football stadium moved out where there is no public transport transport in Atlanta? Yeah, that's that's um, that's the baseball stadium. Um, I think they're out in I think the Cobb County. I think there may be a Cobb County. Um, I think that was a political statement. I didn't think anything wrong was wrong with the baseball stadium. Uh, it, I think it got built for the 1996 Olympics. It was good. And I was completely amazed when I heard they were moving out. Uh, I think it was a political statement. Uh, I think a lot of white people in Atlanta, um, you know, understand Atlanta is seen as a black city. So the, the you know, the the Falcons games have been, quote, as they say, taken over by black people. Uh, the Hawks games have been taken over by black people. And so in many ways, I think this is like the last bastion of white Atlanta. Uh, and, you know, and the Braves putting that stadium out in Cobb Co County, in many ways, it just it just sort of symbolizes that. Uh, is what you're describing with the Atlanta airport an example of a black mayor using privatization to benefit the black residents? Or does this example not count as privatization? I don't think this counts as privatization because the Atlanta airport was still owned by the still, it's the city owns the airport, all right? 
they would just use contractors to go in and to help build the airport. So for instance, UT is building that arena and they're just using private contractors to, to build the arena. Now the privatization piece comes in when you're talking about who's gonna maintain the airport and things of that nature, right? Okay. Um, I know you know a little bit about this, Dr. Morrow. Would you be able to give your thoughts on the historically underutilized business program in Texas? Is this the best Texas can do for minority owned businesses? When you look at the HUB program, historically underutilized businesses, and there, that, that's what uh, uh, public agencies use. And then private corporations have something what they call supplier diversity initiatives. All right. So historically, um, you know, we had these, you know, uh, you had some called minority owned enterprises, which was strictly about race. All right. Uh, at some point, they added women. At another point, they added veterans. At another point, they added uh, people with disabilities. Um, and at another point, they added, I believe, in some places, you know, people from the LGBTQ community. So what Black and Latinx business owners say, you know, they argue that other people are hustling the system. So here's how you can hustle the system, all right? So let's say, um, um, let's say I wanna get, a, I get an IT contract with, Let's say I want to get an IT contract with uh, Baylor Scott and White. And so Baylor Scott and White has what's called a supplier diversity program where they want to do more business with diverse suppliers. So uh, copy paper, uh, medical supplies, medical devices, whatever. So if, let's say I own a medical device company and I understand that if I am a hub business, there are certain advantages that come along with that. Sometimes what they'll do, they'll uh, go find a white woman on paper who will be the, the president of the company, but they'll just do it as a front so they can get that hub certification, which gives them which, which gives them access to more opportunities. But when you peel behind the onion, uh, the woman has just been used as a front, all right? It is, it is a uh, company owned by a white male, but they just found the loophole as a way to take advantage of some of these uh, uh, hub opportunities. Yeah, so now it seems that when there is a big potential development project for a city, they get all these tax breaks. So while they do create some jobs, they are lower paying jobs and the larger Absolutely. profits usually go to a few, mostly white executives and shareholders. Right. Right. Are these type of tax breaks contributing to income inequality? Well, the, the data shows, and thank you, the data shows that when companies move to a city, they expect to pay taxes. Their, their motor for moving somewhere is not to, to, to reduce their tax, uh, reduce their tax liability. The number one reason companies move to a city to a city is because they believe that that city has the has a, a, an educated workforce who can fill those jobs. And what we are seeing is that politicians are just offering these tax breaks when the companies aren't even asking for them. Now, do the companies take them? Absolutely. But, but you know, there was no reason for the city of Austin to, 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 to let Apple come in here on, with, with these tax breaks. And if you look at where Apple's campus is located, it is far Northwest Austin. So even if they wanted to hire low-income people, how would low-income people get there? What amazes me is that I've talked to politicians I'm like, if you're gonna give the tax breaks, can't you demand that 20 to 25% of the jobs, you know, go, go to, you know, um, you know go, go to low skilled workers. You can demand anything, but what we are seeing in many ways are these are just tax giveaways. Let's go to the circuit of America's, I believe the, the racetrack down there by the airport. I believe that was a, a, a tax boondoggle where they were given the opportunity to come and not pay any taxes. What benefit does do Austinites get from Circuit of the Americas? I think they would have two or three events uh, per year. Um, the new soccer stadium that's being built, I believe they've gotten some tax advantages as well. Does Austin need a professional soccer team? No, they don't. We'll go if it's here, but it's not needed. But what we're seeing is that politicians are just offering stuff because they feel that in many ways it'll allow them to close the deal uh, a lot quicker. We go one more. <clears throat> Helen. 
Uh, back to the Atlanta questions. Huh? Um, when Atlanta mayor used exclusive acquisition approach to help black business owners, how did they get the majority vote from the Atlanta city council to, to agree to this method? Well, I, I mean, number one, Maynard Jackson was probably the best urban politician around. He was someone who was very, very well respected in the white community. But also, I don't want you to remember this term. Many black mayors were looked upon as insurance policies, meaning after the riots of the mid to late 1960s, when white property is being burned down and things of that nature, that really scared a lot of the white power structure. So some of them came to the realization that, you know what? we're gonna support a black mayor because we don't want to take the image hit and we don't want, uh, we, we, wanna, we wanna make sure we maintain a climate for business. And if we have race riots around here, that would negatively impact all of us. So let's support a black mayor, let's support um, uh, black city council uh, men and black city council women, and we'll kind of get out of the way and we will kind of let them manage their own people. But again, it was just more of an insurance policy against black unrest. All right. Anything else, Helen? <clears throat> um, you're welcome to go ahead. And we only have about 15, you know, minutes until. Okay. We'll, so All I right. want to make sure that there's Q&A time at the end. Okay, let me wrap this up. So basically, um, although black mayors had ambitious goals, the one thing they didn't anticipate was that they will be dealing with a declining tax base. And I want to explain this. As white people are going to the suburbs, they are being replaced by poor black people, largely from the South who had migrated in. Now, these poor black people, they need more city services. So in 1940, if the city of Cleveland had six health clinics, by 1970, guess what? We may need 12, because although the city has gotten a little smaller, there are now more poor people in the city. So, but when your tax base leaves, black mayors the budgets are small, they're cutting budgets, and they have to cut city services. So nobody talks about how with white flight, there will be basically no new investment in these inner cities for 20 to 30 years. And so no matter how good or how ambitious these mayors were, they have no money. They can't function. You got poor people. They need public housing. They need a public bus. They need public health care. They need all of that stuff. And the city is not able to provide it. So that's why some of these cities declined rapidly because white people stopped investing in those areas. And that was the biggest constraint in many ways black mayors ran into. Not enough money to spread around. So we can, you can blame uh, black mayors for the conditions of the inner cities, but in many ways it's, 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 it's it's misplaced blame because they have no money to operate on. But again, they, they a larger percentage of their population needs services that only a city or a public agency can provide, and they just don't have the money to do it. All right, real quick, I want to talk about a couple issues of the 1970s. So one big issue was, do African Americans stay in the Democratic Party or do they leave? Now, I'll say this. You may, we may not like some of the rhetoric being used um, by some Trump supporters when they talk about Black folks shouldn't be a slave to the Democratic Party. There may be some truth to that. I mean, I really believe that we have been taught that that's the only party we vote for. And what I've been suggesting is that black folk maybe should just step back for a minute. Okay, the Republican Party, we can provide this many votes. What are you offering? Democratic Party, we can offer this many votes. What are you offering? But I do think there is some truth to the fact that the Democratic Party does take advantage of the African-American vote. People seem to be so excited about Kamala Harris being vice, the vice presidential candidate. I'm like, well, why couldn't Stacey Abrams or Kamala Harris or Karen Bass be the, be the Democratic presidential nominee? Black women, the last election, gave the Democrats 95 to 96% of their vote. You talk black men about 80%, 80, 82%. So the base of the Democratic Party is African-Americans. And so the question is, has black America gotten everything out of that relationship or have we just basically been exploited and has our vote been taken advantage of? So that's issue one. The second issue was affirmative action. Now here's where it gets interesting. Here's where we see how liberal people really are, all right? <clears throat> 
All right, so affirmative action, when people hear it, people just get nervous, all right? Because when most people hear the phrase, what they think about is an unqualified black person or an unqualified Latino getting a job over a more qualified white person, all right? That's what they think about when they see affirmative, affirmative action. Can you, put, can you pull up that slide, Heidi, please? All right, that's what they think about. So affirmative action was legislation passed what, late 60s, early 70s, that was designed in many ways to get skilled minority workers into, into the workforce, all right? I think the emphasis, I wanna put the emphasis on skilled there, all right? And so, what, and so some places did have quotas. Some people said, well, we want our workforce, if the, if the state population here is 15% African-American, we want our workforce to be 15% African-American. We want our workforce to reflect in many ways, the demographics of the city we operate in. And so quotas came under attack, all right? And, and people say, well, why do you have a problem with quotas? You never had a problem when the quota was all white, but now you wanna have a quota. So they did, so I think they said quotas were illegal, all right? But even now, this whole idea of affirmative action, it's still, you know, even my white liberal friends, they say, well, Leonard, you know, how much longer should this, how much longer should this go on? All right, I said, well, as long as it's necessary. I am, a, I am an affirmative action baby. Let me say that. I am an affirmative action baby. Ohio State University, like many Big Ten and Pac-12 and Ivy League schools, they would let African-American students in their graduate programs and our GRE scores did not have to be as high as our white counterparts. I am not afraid to admit that. I am not afraid to admit that whatsoever, all right? And so, but here's what I tell folk all the time. If somebody is, if, 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 if you are suggesting that I got into the law school and I don't belong because my, G, my test scores were lower, then if I don't belong, I probably shouldn't get a degree from there. But nobody ever argues that fact because we know when it comes largely to graduate professional school admissions, the hardest thing about getting the degree is getting in the program. And even now, a lot of people at UT have problem with the top 10% rule. I have never seen any data that suggests someone that auto admits do worse than people who are admitted for, from a more holistic, from a more holistic background. All right. So affirmative action was a big issue. Can you put that um, that headline up, Heidi? Uh, for the third or fourth time, it seems like it happens almost every day. The University of Texas is being sued, typically. Uh, there's a white plaintiff, and what they are arguing is that UT discriminated against them because they were white. When these lawsuits are filed, I often laugh, and I often ask, ask people on the street, I say, what percentage of UT do you think is black? You will be amazed at the numbers I hear, 40%, 55%. I'm like, no, you can't look at the football team or the women's basketball team. Uh, let's, let's talk about students in butts and seats. Uh, less than 5%. And many people are shocked by that. And so you would think that if the university is less than 5% black, why would somebody take the time to file a court case and say, well, I didn't get in because you let those black folks in? All right. They never, they never talk about any other group. They never say, well, um, uh, I didn't get in because you let those white people in. No, it's always the fingers always pointed at somebody black. All right. And that really shows in many ways the tenor behind some of these lawsuits. The third big issue of the 1970s was school busing, school busing. All right. School busing in many ways was I think it was tragic. I think it destroyed neighborhoods and I think it destroyed young people. So here's how school busing worked in an effort to integrate the schools, in an effort to integrate the schools. They came up with this idea. What we will do. We will bus black kids from a black neighborhood where they are loved and where they are supported. School may not be the best, but they are loved and, they're, and they are supported and, it, and they have an emotional attachment to the school and the community. We will get them up at 5.30 in the morning and we will put them on a bus and send them an hour across town to a school where nobody knows them, to where the community doesn't want them there, and where the teachers have no expertise in teaching black kids. But this was all designed to integrate the schools. The major problem, in addition to this, just ripping the ripping communities apart, um, man, I lost my thought that quick. The major problem, in addition to this ripping communities apart, 
is that busing in most places only went one way. Only, meaning it wasn't wealthy white kids coming from a neighborhood, going to a school in the inner city. No, it was only the busing typically involved black kids going to white neighborhoods where they weren't one. So when I talk about destroying the fabric of a, of a neighborhood, we live in Round Rock. And so we live in a neighborhood where there's an elementary school in the middle of the neighborhood. And right down the street, there's a middle school in the middle of the neighborhood. And so when you have a community where the school is the focal point, it in many ways brings the community together. And I'm just thinking, what would it be like if we lived in this community, but the kids were just separated and went to schools all over the place? It destroys, I believe, the fabric and the soul of a community. So again, school busing, using black people like guinea pigs, all right, just to, just to fulfill some political agenda. I really believe in neighborhood schools. I believe people should go to school where they live at, and I, because I believe there's a whole lot more goes on in the school than just education. The community aspect, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't minimize. So, and that photograph you see was not in Mississippi, or Louisiana, or Texas. It was in liberal Boston, all right? And that was 1976, and that's one of the most iconic photographs um, of the Black freedom struggle, and also one of the most iconic photographs of the 1970s. And that was in 1976. And you see the symbolism with the American flag. I think they had kind of uh, like punched or tried to stab that guy uh, in his chest or punctured uh, his, his lung or something like that in that photograph. So those are the three issues. Uh, stay in the Democratic Party or not, affirmative action, school busing. All right, we'll take some questions. So we got you from the plantation up to the 1970s. And the last 20 years of black life have been dealing with mass incarceration, all right? What questions do we have, Helen, for the, for the balance of our time? Well, we have a few. Um, All right. So someone asked at the end of the class, mm -hmm. could you discuss, address the efforts by the Texas governor to penalize cities that reorganize their budget to oh. provide, provide more resources for human services and reduce Thank budgets you. for police department? Thank you. I can't wait to argue one of my neighbors. So many conservatives talk about big government government overreach, I shouldn't have to wear a mask. Well, okay, you don't have to, all right? What, this is a classic example of big government. As a municipality, when local elected officials say, this is what we wanna do in our community, they didn't say they had to do it in Cedar Park or Lake Travis or Houston, they said for Austin, this is what we wanna redirect resources, all right? Not defunding the police, Re, uh, reallocating resources in many ways where, you know, social services, mental health, things of that nature, which I believe will make the climate for policing a lot better, all right? And so the question is dealing with Governor Abbott, I believe a couple of days ago, came out with some state law and it said, basically, I could be getting it wrong, that, 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 that cities who reallocate money or defund the police, he said that they, they will freeze that city's property taxes. And to me, that is an example of big government. That is an example of overreach, but it just goes to show in many ways how, you know, when the stars align, people can be very, very hypocritical, right, about what they believe. We say one thing and we do something else, but, but you are absolutely right. I have never, um, uh, Texas politics are interesting to me. Growing up in Ohio, I don't even think I knew who the governor was, you know? And I, I think Abbott's a decent guy. I think he's dealing with other forces. I thought Rick Perry was a decent guy, but I never really, I didn't know who state reps were, but I know in Texas, it seems like state government historically has been very, 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 very powerful. So that, that this is kind of new to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Moore, you know it's coming. Yep. It's about Trump. Yep. <laughs> Can we speak on Trump's agenda and campaign and how it all impacts the black diaspora now and in the future. Let me say this, and I was having this discussion with my nephew, he's an attorney in Atlanta. I said, I'm, I'm gonna say something and I just, I don't want you to respond. I'm just, as a scholar, we just think of stuff, all right? Could it be, could it be in the best interests of black people that Trump gets reelected? Let me explain. Could it be in the best interest of black people that Trump get reelected? All right. That book I was talking about, The Price of the Ticket, it talks about how when Barack Obama got elected president, 
black activism went completely away. It was shut down. And not only was it, it was shut down because when activists wanted to critique Obama about something, they were told, man, be quiet, give the brother a chance. He just can't look out for black folk. He got to look out for everybody. And what they talk about, that is the price of representation. All right. So, so, so let, me, let me go here. The flip side of that, I believe when black people feel like they have an enemy in the White House, I believe we are much more politically aware. I believe we do for self. I believe we build our own institutions. But when we have somebody in the White House who we think who we think thinks looks out for our best interests, what you may get, you may get eight years of Bill Clinton. And although people said he was the first black president because he could play a saxophone and he could go into a black church and sing the songs without looking at the book. You got to understand that it was those Clinton years where the infrastructure and policies were put in place for this whole thing of mass incarceration because we assumed they were looking out for black interests because they weren't hostile, they were polite, and they were nice. And so some people are beginning to argue that, that you no, know, the black community is, is, um, is uh, politically conscious. We are woke now, all right? So if Trump does get reelected, it, it, it causes us to step up our game. But my fear, even now, you, if you're a Democrat, if you're black, you can't be too critical of Biden. You can't be too critical of Kamala Harris, all right? People are saying, yeah, they got issues, but we gotta get Trump out of there. And so I've just been throwing that question around. Now, please don't leave this class by saying, uh, Donald, uh, Dr. Moore said it's better for black folk to vote for Trump if, if Trump gets elected, reelected. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it is something that black folk need to think about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh oh, so Dr. Moore, do you think blacks have gotten anything from voting for Trump Republican in office? I think you talked a little bit about it already, but do you think they've gotten anything? Let me tell you what I appreciate about Trump. Can I be honest? He's straightforward. You never have to worry about what he's thinking. And if you know anything about uh, war and strategy, when you know what your opponent is going to say before they say it, or where they're going to go, he, you can deal with the Trump. I can deal with him because I understand where he's coming from. I mean, not where he's coming from, I understand how he thinks. All right? So to me, it is very easy to strategize against Donald Trump. All right? In terms of pragmatic benefits, I think middle class black folk got more money than their 401ks. I think they got, I think they got more, the stocks are up and things of that nature. But by and large, I don't know if presidents really improve the quality of life for people, to be honest with you. I think that happens when you move down the ballot, school board, city council, municipal judge, county administrators. So I don't know to what, it, you know, I think uh, presidents have the bully pulpit. And I think there's some things the legislation they can pass. But I think it's what about what they represent and who they represent. Uh, with everything we've seen, do you think tr traditional politics works for Black folks? If not, what is the alternative? Let me let me say this and again. I grew up in a half Black and half half Orthodox Jewish community, very tight community. Uh, I've never seen the only ethnic groups I've ever seen have a march are Blacks and Latinos. Never seen any other ethnic group march. Never seen it. Okay. I think other ethnic groups have been, uh, have used in many ways uh, economic pressure to get their issues addressed. Uh, and I do believe that in, that, that in the black community, voting has been overutilized um, as a tool of black liberation. Okay, it's been overutilized as a tool of black liberation. All right. Did I answer the question? I hope so. Okay. Uh <laughs> Um, why does Texas have so many counties compared to most other states? What is the relationship between the extraordinary number of counties and racism? I don't, you know, I don't know. You know, I just got here, what, 13, 13 years ago? I'm not sure. And so, you know, that's one reason I like traveling around the state of Texas. The one thing I know about people in Texas, you all do not like being told what to do. All right. <laughs> so, so maybe, 
all these counties is a lot of maybe all these counties is because well well i don't like you i don't I, you're not gonna tell me what to do i'm gonna go down here and set up my own county but it is a lot all right but texas is just a unique uh unique political animal all of its own that i'm still trying to you know wrap my head around uh, Dr. Moore, uh, this question was answered in the in our Q and A, but uh -huh. you know I think you talk about it often. But you know I know a lot of people have always asked, and it was voted up several times um, about individuals to help with gentrification in Austin. You know we, you talked about it at the beginning, but maybe you can talk a little bit more. So um, you know what we can do. I think the market forces are too strong. I think I think that horse left the barn a long time ago. I really do. And I think the challenge is, is to maybe, uh, what maybe a recommendation is to get with the city demographer and find out what are the next two or three neighborhoods that, gonna, that are gonna be gentrified. I remember I was in, I was in downtown Detroit about 15 years ago. Um, a former student of mine played in the NFL. He had a, he had a uh, engagement party, something like that. And, um, Downtown Chicago, Detroit on a Friday at five o'clock was just empty. It was barren. There was nobody there. I mean, I walk out of the event going to my car and it's like a ghost town. So this was maybe uh, 2006, 2007, something like that. But I noticed as I was leaving the event that they were building new uh, train lines going through the city. Okay. Not a subway, but you know, above, I mean, a, a, like streetcar. And what I've always realized is that when a place looks dead and desolate, but you see stuff like that going on, see a lot of boarded up buildings, but they're building a new train system going through that city. That's how, you know, gentrification is coming. So I really, I think, you know, um, the challenge is to find out, okay, uh, what are the next places that are going to be gentrified in the city of Austin? I, I, I probably think it'll probably be kind of maybe Northeast Austin, which would be interesting. Um, uh, like sp going up Springdale, 51st Street, that area. I think it'll probably be up in that area. Uh, but that's a challenge. But, but, but in terms of historical East Austin, that's gone. Some people are still there. But in terms of putting your efforts together, I mean, there should be a campaign to make sure that these new areas uh, that people can stay in their homes, that there are protections offered for them. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Moore, there's a lot of chatter going on in the chat room. So um, because okay. of your Trump remarks, and I have talked to you about it, so I kind of know your stance on it. But uh, can you shed a little bit more on your they everyone's saying that you're going you're trying to argue for reelection for Trump. See, and that's see, not what see, your intention. See, that's yes. the so, see? yeah. <laughs> So I just want to make no. sure you get your voice in before right. people start tweeting you that you're trying to reelect Trump. <laughs> There's something that happened. Um, if you look at the black freedom struggle, let's say civil war up to 1944. All right. Black people knew that they didn't have a friend in the white house. So they did everything on their own, on their own institution building, do for self, all of that. The March on Washington movement, 1941, I believe 1941, it was a, it was a mass protest because when World War II started, uh, uh, you had all these companies who got jobs, with the, who got contracts with the military, but they were discriminated against black workers. So black activists said, you know, if, if, if these companies have a federal contract with the military, they should be forced to hire black workers. And so what they planned, it was a planned March on Washington in 1941 a planned march on Washington. Uh, FDR didn't want the publicity hit. When he heard about the protests, he passed executive order 8802 that banned racial discrimination uh, in companies that had federal contracts. But, 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 but here's my point. I think the black community, we have lost the ability to do for self, all right? I think we've lost that ability. We've lost it, all right? When we have been forced to do for self, we've done amazing stuff. So I'm not arguing for Trump's reelection, not at all. I'll vote for Biden and Harris. Um, but my point is, uh, let's 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 not let's, let's understand now. We're at this political moment largely because Trump is in office. All right. You see black folk organizing. I remember last year, uh, Essence magazine did this great story on like these 20, 25 black women who had been elected judge in Houston. My argument I'm trying to make is that we are politically alert and politically astute when we understand that the person in the White House is not looking out for our best interests. All right, that's, that's the point I was trying to make. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Dr. Moore. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, thank you for sharing who you vote who you're voting for as well. <laughs> Um, Did that see. calm the waters a little bit? <laughs> Might have, yes. Um, going on a totally different mindset, um, what is the effect of Robin Hood policies? Are they affecting at getting funds to school that need it? Or is the opposition to these tied with this government overreach idea as it pertains to black people and people of color? What's the Robin Hood idea? Will they take from a rich school district and distribute the money? Mm -hmm. Is that it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, the only thing I can go by, I'll say this, um, the public school system in Texas is about 40 years ahead of the public school system in Louisiana and Mississippi. I'll say that. I'll, I'll say that. You can, if you live in Louisiana along I-10, right on that uh, Louisiana-Texas border, you go, over the, you go over the state line to Orange or Beaumont, you're going to get a better education there than you will in Louisiana. Um, and, and I tell people, even the inner city schools in, in Texas, even the schools with large low income populations, I've been impressed with some of the stuff I'm, I've seen going, go, going on in those schools. But again, you got to understand what my frame of reference is, right? If, 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 if I've only been here and I don't have a frame of reference for other states, but what I've seen in Texas is that you got an amazing public, public education system. And I don't know if that's a byproduct of Robin Hood or not. But even in schools that people say are bad, I'm like, what's, what's wrong with this school? All right. But I, but, but I think Texas has one of the best public education systems in the country based upon my vantage point. All right. Is that it, Helen? Well, let's see. Um, what about president's influence on nomination of Supreme Court members, which have the most power in our country? Yes. Here is the issue. I think because we've been focused on symbolism, Democrats have, the, the, what we're seeing now is, is a part of a 40-year Republican Party strategy, okay? And I, and I really believe Trump, I believe he, he says crazy stuff because he's a showman. He wants you looking over here, what are they doing some other stuff over here, all right? And, and what you see is that they, the Republicans have done an excellent job at, at these judgeships, not just Supreme Court, but also in many ways um, at the federal level, all right? And they've been, you know, these down ballot elections and things of that nature. And I really think that we've placed way too much emphasis on the person at the top, as opposed to, you know, let's look at all these other offices that have the ability to affect our life in a much more impactful way. Dr. Moore, I'm going to end on this question. All right. Uh, if I can now find it. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, someone asked, so what is one or two uh, things you want us as a faculty and staff to take away from your class? Um, that's a great question. So, so let, let, let me say this. Um, I think we, we are, as a country, are so it's not our fault, but we are so ignorant about the experiences of ethnic people, of black folks, Latinos. We're so ignorant. And until you understand those experiences, I think we default into this mindset of, at looking at people through the lens of a stereotype. I really think we do that. Even, even when we say we don't do it, Malcolm Gladwell called it blink, right? We see something in, in a split second, you've made some assumptions. So hopefully now you understand the experience. And I like you to do two things. Number one, I would like for you to work in your own community. You know, we don't need anybody going to lead a Black Lives Matter march, you know, on campus. But some of you all are in areas where there are no Black people whatsoever. Some of you all are part of conversations. You're part of clubs, organizations. I think what I would like you to do is to go back into those areas uh, and, 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 start educating them about the African-American experience. I'm just convinced, and I may be naive, that white America just doesn't know. They have no idea about the experiences of black people. And it is not their fault. It is not their fault at all. They, we've never put them in a position where they, where they will be exposed to it, okay? And number two, if you could work, particularly you all are in some, I like to call some of these segregated school districts in, in and around Austin, if you all, could start a campaign to demand 
that in middle school or say high school level that they offer a black history class and a Mexican American history class. That's what we need. Black folk have been asking for it. Latino folk have been asking for it. But I think if it comes from white parents, because here's the deal. What I deal with at UT is white kids have been brought up in a segregated school environment. They get to UT and they can't function. UT is 10% international, 40% white, about 25% Latino, about uh, 23, 24%, but 21% Asian, about 5% black. And it's the first time in their life they've been in a, a diverse environment and they can't function. They can't function. And I know what students tell me. They say, Dr. Moore, my parents had me in all white schools my entire life. I feel ignorant because I don't know anything. And so you don't even, you don't even have to take this from a social justice perspective. If you want your kids to be marketable and, and you want them to be able to function, they have to understand the experiences of other people. So two things, number one, work in your own community. But number two, I would love to see a black history in a, a class mandatory at Lake Travis. Hell, Round Rock High School where my kids go, all right? But we need white parents to start advocating for it, all right? And, and when you all start advocating for it, um, I guarantee it'll get, it'll get put on the books a whole lot quicker than if black folk advocate for it. Thank you, Dr. Moore. I think that's it. It's 1130. Yes. All right. Just a couple more announcements and we're good to go. Thank you all so much. Okay. Um, thank you all for joining our bonus class and sharing your resources in the chat space. Um, and the last in our last class, the sixth class, we mentioned the badge and certificate. If you haven't filled it out yet, you're feel, feel free to do so. It's still open. Um, Yaju will add it to the chat room space. And uh, if you haven't had a chance to fill out the feedback form, it's still open as well. Um, again, all the classes are on our syllabus. And so um, if you would like to go back and uh, look at those resources, um, feel free to do so at your time. Uh, thank you, Dr. Moore, to everyone, um, our team, uh, you know, I'm, Dr. Thanks, Moore team. and I, yeah, and I have Thanks, been on, on the on the face of this call, but uh, you know, Leslie Blair, Jason Moline, uh, Robert Harrington, Heidi Johnson, Millie Lopez, Yoju Choi, um, some other people in our DDC staff have also helped out. So it's a it's a it's a team effort. So thank you, Dr. Yeah. Moore, for uh, giving us a chance to to learn about the history of the Black experience yeah, as well. Fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, right. Please be on the lookout. If you haven't already done so, please uh, uh, join our listserv on ddc.utex or diversity.utexas.edu. Dr. Moore will be doing some, be on the lookout because he'll be doing some more amazing stuff, um, doing some interviews with some people, and we're going to be offering a few more classes throughout the year. So thank you and have a great weekend. And crossing all our fingers for next week when uh, UT starts uh, the, the campus and it opens, although it is open now, I've heard. <laughs> Jason, do you wanna take the music? Do you wanna turn on the music? Here we go. Okay, great.